Hi guys. So back when I first started this channel, one of my first few videos was kind of an overview of a bunch of different doll lines that were obviously inspired by Monster High. You know, that wonderful time in the doll world where we were seeing a lot of unnatural skin tones, high levels of articulation, a story-based content, and well, monsters. But there were a lot of monsters. I don't recommend you like go back and watch that video. It's old and crunchy and honestly not that good, but I do remember it being fun to make and I wanted to revisit that same concept, but with another doll line. That being, of course, Ever After High. Because around the time Ever After High was introduced, a very similar thing happened. Suddenly, there were a ton of fairy tale based dolls and media, and so a lot of things were accused of riding its coattails. And I want to be clear, just because I include something here, that does not mean I personally believe they intentionally copied Ever After High or that they are actually ripoffs. Only that it was something that they were commonly accused of. With Monster High, where there was a very visible and obvious ripple effect from its success, it honestly does seem almost like a complete coincidence that we got all these fairy tale medias at exactly the same time, which I'm sure it's not a complete coincidence. Toy companies especially are always spending a lot of effort in trying to predict trends so they can get products on shelves before said trend passes. So it's more likely that a lot of similar ideas were just being passed around at the same time. Unfortunately for a lot of people, or for fandoms I should say, the concept of being a fan of two different things at once, it kind of eludes them. So it is instinctual almost to make everything into a competition. If you're unfamiliar with Ever After High, I apologize, but I can't really go extremely deep into it. But to give a quick overview, it's a doll line by Mattel that was conceptualized as a sister line to Monster High. Rather than the children of legendary monsters, the characters are children of fairy tale characters. Like Apple White is the daughter of Snow White, Raven Queen is the daughter of the Evil Queen, etc. The franchise was officially launched in May 2013. Remember that date, it is extremely important. Ever After High has a pretty expansive and in-depth plot told through diaries that came with the dolls, animated specials, and also a series of books as well. The story revolves around these children attending the titular Ever After High, where they must pledge to follow their destinies and relive their parents' stories, and are told that if they don't do so, they cease to exist. Raven Queen, however, does not want to follow her mother's destiny to become a villain, so she rebels, inspiring other students dissatisfied with their stories to do the same. Apple White, the other main character, believes that she cannot have her happy ending without Raven, so she attempts to convince her to follow her destiny. Thus, it sets the stage for the plot. And now, before we get into these so-called ripoffs, first, a quick word from today's sponsor. Today's video is sponsored by Native. So, we all like to smell good, right? Hopefully. And before pretty recently, the composition of deodorants was not something I really paid a lot of attention to. But I did notice I was never fond of how a lot of them really felt on my skin and also how they smelled. Especially men's deodorants, like they just weren't for me. So that's why I was pretty excited to give Natives deodorants a try. And Natives products have simple but effective ingredients. Stuff you're already pretty familiar with, like coconut oil or shea butter. They're aluminum free and paraben free, also vegan and cruelty free as well. They uh, feel great when I put them on, like they're not sticky or unpleasant in any way. And the best part is, they smell so good and work extremely well. Like I work as a tour guide. My job is literally just walking around outside in the Texas heat. So needless to say, I'm putting these to the test. And literally, I still come home from work feeling fresh and smelling great. Uh, the scents I have. So I love really sweet scents. So I got lavender and rose, which is a lighter scent. It's very clean and fresh and floral. Sweet Peach and Nectar, which is a little sweeter, summery, very peachy, also really great. Oh, my personal favorite, the Buttercream and French Vanilla, which 
when I put it on, I feel like this is so specific, but I feel like Angel Cake, the strawberry shortcake doll, when I put this on, it smells so sweet and delicious and I love it. And also from Native's new candy shop collection, Gummy Bears, which yes, does smell so much like gummy bears. It's excellent. If you'd like to try Native for yourself, use my link and code DARLINGDOLLS to get 20% off your first purchase at Native. This offer is available site-wide, but only for a limited time, so stock up and save. Thanks again to Native for sponsoring today's video. Let's get back into it. So the first rival franchise to Ever After High that I want to talk about is probably the one that has the most intense and long-standing beef between the fandoms. That is, of course, Disney Descendants. And not to mention my backlog yet again, but I do also have a video deep diving more in depth into the feud between Ever After High and Descendants. But that's more about the background between the companies, Mattel and Disney, than the content of the movies or the dolls. The Disney Descendants franchise was first announced in December of 2013, but the first movie didn't premiere until July of 2015. So if you want to believe that Descendants intentionally copied Ever After High's concept, yeah, the timing is a little suspicious. However, I did come to the conclusion in that video that Descendants was not an intentional ripoff of Ever After High, and in fact, there is early concept art for Descendants by artist and toy designer Whitney Paulette that dates back to 2012, before Ever After High was announced. However, I do definitely see where the conflict between the two comes from. Intentionally or not, the plot of Descendants follows some very similar beats to Ever After High. The characters are all children, or descendants of Disney characters. Specifically, the main cast are primarily children of Disney villains, who are basically treated as an extension of their parents, but over time learn that they want to break that cycle of cartoon villainy and become good. The setting is a high school specifically for the children of these important figures. There's a lot of musing about destiny and birthright and nature versus nurture. But that said, I think these are things that are kind of natural to incorporate when you set a story in what's essentially a fairy tale world. The philosophies of both franchises are basically the same. Like, they more or less have the same message of uh, choosing your destiny, but they approach it in their own way. Like, Ever After Highs is almost a sort of a moral debate, asking if it's worth endangering the lives of others, if it means creating a better outcome. Whereas, a descendant seems to approach it more with a commentary on classism. Like, the villain kids are, for all purposes, underprivileged and unable to access the same opportunities as the children of the princes and princesses. Jeez, that makes them sound really deep, doesn't it? And you can argue about which approach is better or who is more successful in their message, but what I'm trying to say is more or less that I don't think Descendants lifted any kind of content from Ever After High, uh, but that's the thing. It's kind of more interesting, in my opinion, to explore the ways two similar franchises have different ways of basically doing the same thing, rather than just completely writing one off as a, a shameless copy. Uh, to add fuel to the fire, though, Descendants also had a doll line. These were done by Hasbro, and they're... alright. I think the sculpts are really nice, but unlike Ever After High, who was a doll line first and a movie series secondly, Descendants was primarily a movie franchise, a live-action one at that, and I think the dolls are pretty reflective of that. And though the costume design in the Descendants movies are fun and pretty creative, not counting the wigs though, those were kind of awful, they just didn't translate to really strong doll designs. Like Ever After High, your first impression is probably the dolls. So you have to know looking at Apple on the first glance, she's based on Snow White. Maddie Hatter, she's the Mad Hatter, obviously. Lizzie Hart's very clearly the Queen of Hearts. I may be biased, but I do think Ever After High did a really good job of playing around with and incorporating fairy tale elements and iconography to make some really incredible character designs. To be fair, 
They did have a lot more freedom than Descendants, though, as Descendants was limited specifically to the Disney versions of these fairy tale characters. And with a live action movie, it's a little different. We don't need incredibly strong design cues because we're going to be told immediately exactly who these characters are in other ways. But if I just saw Jane with no context, it would take me a few guesses to know she's meant to be based on the fairy godmother from Cinderella. Audrey, you know, I wouldn't know immediately she's meant to be based on Aurora. The Descendant stalls also take a much more contemporary and modern approach to the fashion, which I think makes sense. Since if they just designed a bunch of princess dresses, they would more or less be reinventing the Disney princess dolls. But it does come at the cost of the dolls losing a lot of that quote-unquote Disney magic. I think the best Descendants dolls are the ones based on Wicked World, which were a series of animated short-form webisodes. I think they were able to be a lot more imaginative with the designs, and we got a few original characters too that I think are pretty well designed, like Allie, the daughter of Alice, Freddy, the daughter of Dr. Facilier, CJ, daughter of Captain Hook, and Jordan, the daughter of Jeannie. Unfortunately, they also kind of eh, complicate the franchise in the grand scheme of things because the Wicked World characters have counterparts in the movies that share the same parents, but they're not the same characters and they're not really acknowledged either. Like, they were created entirely independent of each other. Like, in the third movie, the daughter of Facilier is Celia, and she's a totally different character. I do think some of the novels might have attempted to rectify this by saying that they're siblings, but I just, I don't think it was extremely well thought out. Nonetheless, the Descendants franchise is still very much alive, with a fourth movie in the works to be released soon. I don't know if it will include dolls, though. Hasbro started making the Descendants dolls around the same time they got the license for Disney Princesses, which they recently lost back to Mattel, but... We'll see. And next in line, there's Regal Academy. Uh, this one isn't quite as well known, but I do remember when it first came out that it was pretty much instantly written off as a copy of Ever After High. Descendants had the benefit of already having Disney and its fandom on its side, so that helped it deflect a lot of that controversy. But Regal Academy was an entirely new IP, so pretty much literally was just thrown to the wolves, uh, to the, the big bad wolves. What is Regal Academy? Well, I'm so glad you asked. Regal Academy was an Italian animated series co-created by Eugenio Straffi and Joanne Lee, produced by Rainbow Studio. If a few of those names sound familiar, it's because Eugenio Straffi, through Rainbow, is also the creator of the ever-iconic Winx Club. The series premiered in May of 2016 in Italy, then a few months later in August 2016 here in America. The story follows a girl named Rose Cinderella, a seemingly ordinary girl from Earth who travels to fairy tale land and learns she is the granddaughter of, shockingly, Cinderella. She enrolls in Regal Academy, where she befriends the grandchildren of other fairy tale characters, whose grandparents, I feel, should be obvious enough based on their names. Astoria Rapunzel, Hawk Snow White, Joy LaFrog, and Travis Beast. Yeah, and you thought Ever After High's name scheme was subtle. The second season would add a new primary character, an exchange student from China named Ling Ling Iron Fan which I don't remember if it was ever confirmed that she's based on the character from Journey to the West, but if so, that's actually a pretty cool reference. But again, a premise that is fairly similar to Ever After High, only this time the characters are grandchildren, so one more step removed. However, even though Regal Academy didn't premiere until three years after Ever After High's announcement, it was in development for an extremely long time, since 2009, actually. It appeared to have gone through a lot of different concepts before they settled on what would become Regal Academy. A concept art from art director Simone Borselli shows it titled as Twisted Fairy Tales, and that appears to be a more mature, kind of a dark comedy take. 
An article on Animation World Network from September 2013 titles it as Royal Academy, and aside from minor differences like character designs and names, it appears to be pretty similar to the finished product from three years later. But uh, needless to say, it's not something they could have produced and developed and announced in the span of just a few months after Ever After High was launched, even if it did spend a few more years in development. Uh, the show itself, it's a TV series and not short-form webisodes and movies like Ever After High was, so it's obviously a lot more episodic and drawn out. It doesn't quite get as uh, deep as Ever After High did. Like, there's no thought-provoking moral queries or large debates about destiny. It's really more based in humor and slapstick comedy and seems to be aimed at just a, a slightly younger demographic than Ever After High was. Uh, which is fine, obviously, that doesn't make it any worse than Ever After High, but it is very much a different experience. In my opinion, it has even less in common with Ever After High than Descendants does. Like, the basic premise is kind of where the strongest similarities end. I remember watching the first episode back when it first came out and thinking it was not that great, I'm not gonna lie. It was just very awkward, the dialogue wasn't very well written, the humor wasn't really to my taste, and the animation was also pretty rough. I think this was Rainbow's first big foray into a fully CGI animated series, and it just came off very unpolished. Like, even speaking as someone that loves cartoons and things aimed at people way below my age level, I just found it, like, shockingly hard to get through. But for the purpose of this video, I did give it a second try, and honestly, it's not as bad as I thought it was. The animation does improve over time, or at least gets easier to watch, as does the humor and the writing, it's still definitely not one of my most favorite shows I've ever watched, but I actually do think it does some clever things with the fairy tale premise, and the characters really grew on me over time. Like a lot of Rainbow's shows, it has a really large anime influence. You can really see it in the character expressions, and also the fact that Rose is very much like your a typical shoujo protagonist. She's very clumsy and kind of obnoxious and not the brightest, but it still manages to charm everyone through her friendly nature and her endless amount of optimism. A Regal Academy also has a doll line, of course, but it's a similar situation to Descendants. The franchise is an animated series first and foremost, and the dolls are still an important source of revenue, but ultimately secondary and at the whims of the designers on the show itself rather than the other way around. The dolls in Italy were manufactured by Giacchi Preziozzi, and they're cute, but again, I just don't think the character designs are quite as strong or as inspired as Ever After High's. The quality of them look pretty passable, I think, especially for a younger audience, and I do think the designs, although maybe not as elaborate as Ever After High's, did translate pretty nicely onto the dolls, so the execution is there. In America, the dolls were actually manufactured by a company called Aldi Toys. These were a few inches shorter than the Italian dolls and look around the same quality, just sometimes with less articulation and maybe a few less details in the outfits, but I still think they captured the characters pretty well and Unlike Giochi Preziozzi, Aldi also made dolls for the male characters and also Vicky, who was one of the primary villains. The second and last season of Regal Academy wrapped up in 2018, and although I don't know if it's been officially discontinued or not, uh, no new episodes have aired and it's unlikely any are being produced. I don't know though, if Lolly Rock can get its third season confirmed six years later, maybe there's hope for Regal Academy too. The last one I'm going to talk about is a franchise that, like Ever After High, was actually primarily a doll line. Fairy Tale High, which debuted from the company SK Victory in June of 2013. So, uh, barely even a month after the launch of Ever After High. And again, a very similar premise. Although, whereas Ever After High features the children of fairy tale characters, 
Fairy Tale High promoted itself as sort of a prequel. So the actual fairy tale characters themselves, but as teenagers, going to high school really before their stories took place, if that makes sense. For that reason, the characters are all referred to as a teen versions of themselves. So they're officially named like Teen Rapunzel, Teen Snow White, Teen Little Mermaid, etc. The first and only lineup of dolls featured eight characters. Little Mermaid, Alice, Snow White, Rapunzel, Cinderella, Belle, Sleeping Beauty, and Tinkerbell. The line launched with a, a pretty aggressive advertising campaign. Like, I remember every doll reviewer and their mother being sent these dolls. And the general opinion was more or less what you could gauge from just looking at them. Perfectly fine, but not great quality and sort of underwhelming compared to the other options. The line also launched with short-form animated webisodes, but only two episodes were ever produced, and they're an easy way to pass three minutes, I guess. There's not really anything noteworthy about them, other than how uncanny and low effort the animation was, with three of the four featured characters all having the exact same hair model, and also not really resembling their doll designs at all. And it should it kind of end there, shouldn't it? It was launched basically at exactly the same time as Ever After High, so that basically debunks it being a ripoff, right? But looking more into this doll line, I fell down a rabbit hole of some very interesting information. For one, this line fell into some legal trouble, not with Ever After High, but Disney of all things. From what I can tell, it never devolved into a formal lawsuit or anything like that, but an article from Forbes quotes Scott Koff, the president of SK Victory. He says going up against Disney is not easy, and adds, we are a modern day David versus Goliath story. SK Victory and Disney ultimately entered what was referred to as a non-assert agreement, which is basically, uh, from what I can tell, a formal way of saying, I won't sue you, but I will be watching very closely. Which, I do want to say, looking at the fairy tale High characters, yeah, I think it's pretty obvious they took quite a lot of inspiration from the Disney princesses. Additionally, I took a look at the brand presentation, which was very kindly linked to me by iMaddieMadster on Twitter. Big thank you to her. And in it, you can see how the character designs and concepts kind of changed over time. Like, the original lineup seemed to have included a teen Wicked Witch instead of Tinkerbell. The presentation also included artwork of some male characters and, a, quite horrifyingly, a teen Pocahontas character. And there's at least two different concept arts for this character, which is like three too many for someone who is very much not a fairy tale character. But I think that's pretty indicative of exactly how much they were lifting from Disney. Allegedly, I guess I should say. More fun things from this brand presentation. Presenting the possibility of a future live-action series, which in this graphic says, Age up the series and target high school musical demographics. G-rated, PG, or R-rated. Oh my god, what exactly were they planning? Also, this random image with literally no context of Teen Little Mermaid and a goldfish with her exclaiming, There goes Cousin Cassandra again. <laughs> I don't know. But the rabbit hole deepens. In a graphic titled Copyrights and Trademarks, there's a logo for Toon Studio of Beverly Hills, which is important because this Toon Studio of Beverly Hills is behind another doll line that was released around the same time. Once Upon a Zombie, which reimagined fairy tale princesses as, well, zombies. It's not a coincidence that these doll lines just happen to exist at the same time. Their designs, art assets, story concepts, they both came from the same place, this Toon Studio of Beverly Hills, who uh, seems to be a company who really does nothing but make artwork and various merchandise of fairy tale princesses that skirt on the edge of a lawsuit from Disney. All their trademarks are registered under the same company, one called United Trademark Holdings Incorporated, which is like 
the single most generic name for a company I could possibly imagine. But even now, they have pending trademarks for things like Superhero Little Mermaid, Cyber Cinderella, A Dia de Muertos Snow White Day of the Dead, A Zombie Winnie the Pooh, which was trademarked specifically for NFTs. Oh my god. The Once Upon a Zombie dolls were manufactured by Wowee, which is a very well-established and respectable company. SK Victory, the company that made the fairy tale High dolls, however, seems to have been made with the express purpose of making the fairy tale High dolls. That same Forbes article from earlier mentioned that SK Victory was established only eight months before fairy tale High launched. And the fairy tale high dolls only spent a total of six weeks in production, which is absolutely insane. Normally, a doll line, especially a brand new one, spends around a year in production, from initial design to official release. Sometimes longer, sometimes up to two years. Six weeks is literally unheard of. Even the Barbie and the Rockers dolls, which were infamous for having an unusually short and rushed production time so they could beat the launch of Jim and the Holograms, took four months. Six weeks in production. Like, that honestly raises way more questions than it answers. Why were they so rushed? We can only speculate. But Fairy Tale High didn't really take off the way they were hoping, and SK Victory didn't really do anything else following that. They basically lived and died with Fairy Tale High. But yeah, there you go. A look at three prominent Ever After High ripoffs. But not really ripoffs, but I need a proper title, so I'm going to call them ripoffs, even though I don't really think they are, so please don't get mad at me. I hope you enjoyed the video, though. Let me know all your thoughts down below. Let me know if you were a fan of anything I talked about, if you kept up with them, if you bought the dolls, watched the movies or the shows. Tell me all about it. And when you're done with that, just be sure to like and subscribe for any future fashion doll content. Thank you.